Well, welcome to our panel. We could not be happier to have you. My name is Vanessa. Most folks know me as Mozzadrella, which is my GitHub handle. And I'm an instructional designer, and I manage teacher programs here at GitHub. And the reason I do this work, and the reason I think this work is so important, is because I believe in fostering a more collaborative society. And we do that through using the real world tools like Git and GitHub. And today you're gonna to hear from three stellar educators uh, who use Git and GitHub as part of their learning design to engage their students. And so if you want to be like these wonderful stellar educators, we do have some tools to help you get there. And if you're interested in using GitHub, well, okay, how many people are afraid of getting stuck with GitHub? How many people are afraid of getting stuck with GitHub in front of your students? Okay, great. So uh, we developed this teacher training program called Campus Advisors. So you can master Git and GitHub and commit with confidence. It's specifically for teachers and specifically for the classroom context. There's four modules, they're online. You can take them at your own pace. They'll walk you through the basics of Git to so the internals and the data structures and then individual work and then group work. Uh, so if you're particularly afraid of students having merge conflicts, uh, and then we'll walk you through our student, our student programs. And those are live now and you can find them at education.github.com slash advisors. So without further ado, let's dig in. Uh, first up, talking about his courses is Ming Chao. And Ming Chao is an accomplished teacher at Tufts, winner of the 2017 Lerman Neubauer Prize for Outstanding Teaching uh, at Tufts. Um, and we know that he's a great teacher because one of his students, Lexi, interned with us over the summer and now she's coming on board as a full-time GitHuber. So we're fans. Uh, and when I first started working with Ming, it was very clear that he had a a very unique and strong point of view on computer science education. Uh, and the foundation was, was communication. And I'm actually gonna directly quote him because this quote continues to make me chuckle. In every assignment, in every lab, students have to write a readme. And a lot of them ask, why the heck do I have to write that? Well, the difference between a good engineer and a great engineer boils down to writing skill and communication. So that's the whole point of having a readme for every project. Please welcome Ming Chao. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. I didn't expect that. And uh, <laughs> when I got the invitation, when uh, Vanessa asked me to come to speak to SIGC, it was an offer I absolutely could not refuse. In fact, I've personally been using GitHub since 2000, 2010. And what I want to talk today is why Git? and why GitHub? So, why Git? So, it boils down to five reasons. And number one, using Git is a way to keep track of your changes. You know, instead of fumbling and making copies, bazillion copies of different files, you know, you have a master repository of, of work and you keep track of changes. Which also boils down to another important thing. When you, once you use Git, um, it's very hard to lose your stuff. It's almost impossible to lose your work if you do it correctly. And if you do commits, you're forced to document your work and your changes. So that's, all, that's also a byproduct of uh, keeping track of your, your changes and your work as well. Um, with using Git, uh, it's absolutely necessary for collaboration purposes. And one last thing, is very, very important, is that now, uh, using Git in revision control has been just an absolute basic skill in tech. Um, if, you, if, if you have students that are going to do software or development uh, or engineering uh, for the long run, they have absolutely need to, to use uh, Git. And let me exp show you a, a very good example. Uh, a friend of mine, Bill Langenberg, he and I went to school together. So Bill is now a technical manager at TripAdvisor. And I invite him every so often to give a presentation on what it's really like working in software engineering and in industry to my web, my web programming class, which is a lot of sophomores and juniors. And one of the slides that he posted uh, explained is software engineering in the wild. And one of the expected skills to have is using a revision control like 
get. I mean, they just don't have the time to, to train people, you know, on the job and, you know, and learning getting on the job is just going to be like immediately it's going to be a waste of their time. And so using getting revision control have boiled down to a very important basic skill that all students, especially if you're going to do technical and engineering work, needs to know. So personally, I've been using Git uh, in GitHub since 2010. But I do want to credit the one person who actually really convinced me to use it in the classroom. And that's my dear colleague, Norman Ramsey. So back in 2009, there was this is a deleted Stack Overflow post. So it got deleted because it, got, it was too opinionated of a question on like what should, and I'm sure you, you, we face this problem all the time, is what should computer science uh, curriculum be teaching? And, you know, should we be teaching things like revision control? Should we be teaching things like uh, inter uh, continuous integration? And Norman Ramsey in 2009, my dear colleague, wrote, university should absolutely teach distributed source control starting with the first programming course. It is a fine way to distribute code to students, can fix bugs easily, and later courses they can use it to help support peer programming, the collaboration piece. Uh, we should use it to, to treat it, uh, to make it uh, easy as a habit, not to make a big fuss about it. Of course, the irony of this whole thing is, you know, uh, you know I've executed his vision quite well. That it hasn't become a, a double-edged sword, as you'll see a little bit later. Now, why GitHub? Now, Git and GitHub are two different things, okay? Now, GitHub, as Norman actually has wrote it, it becomes this, this network effects, okay? It has a source code with uh, source uh, code review capabilities, and this one last piece, which a lot of students uh, realize, especially once they start looking for jobs and internships, is that GitHub has become the de facto resume and portfolio, and because now you know, as you know, that you know, looking for jobs and internships, lots of employers look at side projects very heavily, and. You know, and, and it has been said a few times by employers that we do look at people's GitHub repositories. And I'll show you an example email that would show that. In fact, we got criticism back in September of 2014 from an employer say, you know, we have, a, I see a lot of nice resumes, but, you know, they, none of them actually have a GitHub account where I can actually take a look at their work. And that's, that was the feedback we got from employers in 2014. One thing I did not mention here is how I also use GitHub uh, for job references as well. When I, and I get to quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of employers calling me for job references for students. And one of the big questions they ask me is, tell me about this student's writing style and code uh, abilities. For me, I don't need to go and, uh, go and talk for like five, ten minutes. All I need to do now is because I have a good collection of student previous work is, you know what, that's easy. Here is the app, project, the mobile app project that the student did in my class. Here's a link to the GitHub repository. Here you go. And then, of course, the employer said, "Oh, thank you very much. This is very clear. Okay, I can. I, I see. I see." So it also can be used for. It is also used for uh, job references as well too. Make my life easier, and for the employers because they get something tangible to see. So how I use GitHub? Well, in Git. Well, one is my uh, web programming class, Comp 20 at Tufts University. Uh, since 2012, the course has over 80 students. Um, uh, you know, it's taught each, uh, each semester. We're talking about over 80. Now, this semester has 86. Uh, it has ballooned up to 125 at one point. It's also taught in the summer. And so, GitHub and Git are both required to submit not only lab, but also assignments as well, too. But there's a secret sauce at the end of this class, okay? Um, students are given, each student is given a private GitHub repository to submit labs and assignments. Students in the class also must work in a team for a semester group project. So this is also a repository that is created for each and every team. In fact, coincidentally, early this morning, yes, early this morning before I took my flight out here, I created 20 private GitHub repository for 20 teams uh, for the semester group project for this semester. Okay? 
And so what happens is at the end of the course, now I don't tell the students this at the beginning of the semester why, they have, at the, why they're given a private GitHub repository. Now one of the biggest issues, especially undergrads in computer science, is not everyone has side projects to show. But as I said earlier, how important, you know, having a portfolio, GitHub portfolio, is important to demonstrate to, like, employers, um, even family members, to show that they're not spending the 60, 70 thousand, they're not wasting the 60, 70 thousand, thousand, thousand dollars. And I tell students on the very last day of class, here is why I made each and every one of you a private GitHub repository. It's not for, you know, to, to, to prevent cheating. Uh, in labs and assignment. But after this course is over, I'm making each and every private repository public because I want you to all take the work back. I want you to take back ownership of this private GitHub repository so you can now use this as not only a reference for web development down the road, but this is also uh, a, a learning portfolio for you as well too. The last lab of the, uh, of the course is to write a reflective piece, which is their main readme at the top of their private GitHub repository. And so this is the email I sent out to students at the on the very last day of class, my gift to you, take back ownership of your work. You can now op use this as a learning portfolio and to show your parents and friends that you're not wasting the money that you're spending for school. Okay. So how, so you may be curious, and I know, I've, I heard, saw earlier, a lot of hand, there's a lot of fear in adopting Git and GitHub for your courses, okay? So how is Git and GitHub being taught in, in the class? Now, the goal of using Git and GitHub for the class is not mastery. That's not the point. Even for me, I've used Git for almost, you know, almost a decade now. I'm not even a master. I even struggle with merge conflicts as well. I, I even struggle with all that. Stuff. I don't even know a lot of like some of the stuff. I'm still confused sometimes what rebasing even means. But the point is not to master Git and GitHub. The point is just to get into the habit of using revision control, as Norman Ramsey said, as I mentioned uh, earlier in my slide. Okay. You know, one thing I believe in, in terms of teaching philosophy, is to throw the students into the wolves. You know, this is the, these, and no, it's these four years, this is a place where you should learn by making, you should learn by making mistakes. You got to be accustomed to using these real tools. There are no training wheels. I'm not in the business of baby feed, uh, baby uh, or spoon feeding you all the time. So you're going to have to use it as it is, as this is like your first internship or your first job, okay? So, you know, we have a lab on using Git and GitHub. Their first assignment actually is to create a personal website uh, using, uh, using Git and GitHub. Uh, not using, you know, creating their special repo, the username.github.io. Um, there's tutorials, even one of my former TAs and head TAs of the course have written a Git tutorial before. And again, the key message is habit not mastery. And that's my friend Rob Graham, uh, very well, uh, uh, you know, huge in, in cybersecurity, really, really good, great, great guy, great contributor, made this great point. Yeah, everyone, especially in industry, we use Git, but now it's not just you that uh, haven't figured out how it works. So the point is, is habit, not mastery. Of course, it works out really well, but of course, there are also challenges as well. Especially in my web course right now, about, you know, every semester, about 20% of the questions are all Git related. Like, uh, I can't get this thing to work. Uh, I'm having, I, you know, I can't push my work because I'm having this error. And of course, it could boil down to a reading question, as well, uh, a reading question as well, too. And it is quite amazing that, you know, a lot of students don't know what an SSH, SSH key is. Um, but students do get into the habit of using Git and GitHub, not only at, you know, after taking my course. It worked out a little bit too well. In fact, one of the biggest struggles is, uh, in some courses, students love using, they, they now see the value of Git and GitHub, that they decide to post work from other classes and make them public, which becomes an academic integrity um, problem. 
And uh, honestly, and quite honestly, we haven't really figured that one out yet. And so right now, the only best thing that we can do is putting out wildfires every so often. We see a student posting, uh, posting uh, code from the third uh, course in computer science or in our programming language courses, including alums, we ask them to take them down. So it's like fighting fires. So it's not without any problems. But right now, the firefighting problem of telling people to remove old code from their repository, uh, that's the biggest challenge that we got. Uh, way too many success stories from students and alums uh, on using Git and GitHub, especially, you know, one of the things about using Git and GitHub is that, yeah, students don't like it initially. They don't. Oh boy, a lot, he, you know, I had one student, in fact, the first gentleman, uh, nah, he, 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 was, he did game development now in San Francisco. Oh boy, did he hate using Git. Oh boy, did he hate using GitHub. Oh yeah, he struggled with, with, uh, with merge conflicts. Lots of students are on that boat. But the results and the value doesn't come apparent until after, like, after graduation, especially one or two years out of school when they actually do this stuff for the real say, oh yeah, now I get it. It's that, okay, now I actually uh, uh, get the value of using Git and GitHub and why you did it uh, in, uh, in, in your courses, more success stories. So if you're interested, I'm gonna make these slides publicly available to everyone. Um, I also have code here on how I create private GitHub repositories for um, large classes. Um, I have code, this, this is code where uh, you create, you know, a batch of private GitHub repositories for, oh, I don't know, n number of students, and also for teams as well too. I use it not only the GitHub API, but the OctoKit gem for uh, Ruby, and uh, some references as well. So I'll be here uh, if, if anyone have any questions. Uh, uh, are we going to do questions now, or uh, we're going to wait? Okay. Uh, my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. Great job. Wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Mine Chetinkaya Rundel. Uh, and Mina comes to us from the statistics department at Duke University, which I had the pleasure of visiting this spring. And what I really appreciate about Mina's courses, both statistics and data science, is that she has a wide variety of types of students. They, you know, she's got anthro, she's got English, and she not only teaches with open source tools like R and R Studio, so that they can learn how to use stuff and grow with it and not have to pay for it. Um, but she tackles the collaboration aspect of this stuff head on with this variety of students from different backgrounds. So she is actually gonna to talk to you about those ac uh, aspects of collaboration and her workflow at Duke. Please welcome Mine. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, as uh, Vanessa introduced me, my name is Mina, and I am a statistician, so I'm a little bit scared, <laughs> but be nice, okay? <laughs> I tried really hard to use correct terminology. Okay, so the too long didn't read version, or maybe the too long didn't listen version of this talk is three million points. So I wanted to hit those head on first, and then we'll get into the details of it. Um, the first one is that you only get one first day of class, okay? So my suggestion is start with something that excites students, teach the necessary evils later. Number two, First micromanage and then set free. So if you want students to have well-organized repositories with well thought out commits, well then teach the best practices early to them. They're not gonna just get there by themselves. Three, you may have seen these like t-shirts people say where Git happens. We know where it comes from. No, Git doesn't just happen, <laughs> okay? So I think you have to carve out instructional time, especially for failure prone situations. And don't just expect students to figure out the Git aspect of things as you're teaching the more important content. If you're teaching students to learn to use Git and GitHub, you're doing it because it's important, make time for it. 
So, we'll start with a little bit of a context. Um, I teach an Intro to Data Science course, and the students that are coming into this course are students with little to no background in computing, data science, or statistics, but I think enthusiasm to learn. So they're there because they want to learn. Um, and what we want them to come out from this is, you know, I secretly have in my heart, I hope they'll be stats majors, but really what we have them to come out, what we want them to come out with is to be able to tackle data head on in a statistical or a computational context in their following courses. Um, as part of the statistics major, what I want the other courses that come in the sequence to be able to assume is that these students are have a good computational base so that we can focus on the methodology and they come in there knowing how to, you know, how to navigate the computational tools. Um, I've been teaching this content in two separate courses at Duke, and uh, one of them is a first year undergraduate seminar where I've had the luxury of having only 18 students in the class, so everything is a lot easier when you have only 18 people in front of you, in my experience. And then uh, starting this semester, uh, the course has been quite popular, so we've opened it up to a wide audience in the spring semester, so I have 80 students because that's where we capped it at right now, and already I'm kind of struggling to catch up with trying to figure out what are the types of things that worked in that context that are maybe need a little bit of tweaking now that we have a bigger class. So this course has a variety of goals about um, how to approach data from a statistical perspective, um, how to start with the, at the beginning with the data collection um, as opposed to the rectangular nice data you can apply statistical methodology to. So we wanna go back a couple steps to reality really. Um, we do a lot of modeling in the course and we also underscore effective communication. But I'm gonna set these two, four important goals aside for the latter two that I'm going to focus on in this talk. One of them is teach, not just expect, but teach reproducible computation. And the other one is encourage and enforce working collaboratively, but that doesn't mean writing a final paper. That means thinking collaboratively, coding collaboratively, and writing and presenting as well throughout the semester. So the toolkit that I use is here. Um, we use R as our language. Are there any R users here? Oh, good. I can kind of say whatever I want. It seems. <laughs> um, so, um, and we interface with it in our studio, and they do literate programming. That's where some of the reproduci reproducibility aspect comes in. And we also have the version control. So, why do we have the version control embedded into this? Um, after all, Git has been designed for software developers, and that is not what these students are doing. That is not what a data scientist day-to-day -day does. But what a data scientist day-to-day -day does is iterative data analysis. You often have to go down a path, realize, nope, I gotta backtrack a little bit, go down this other path, I'm not really sure where this data is going to take me, but I need to be able to document my steps along the way, and it, go, and it works really well for that. When you're analyzing data, you also produce a huge amount of artifacts, plots, and files, and subsets of data and whatever and there you need a method for kind of keeping this sanity in check and it works well for that as well so we use it for the version control we use it for the collaboration aspect the platform is already there so why not it's good from an instructional perspective for accountability. I can always peek through these repositories and see who in the team is actually uh, submitting commits and not just looking at the number of commits but actually what they entailed and also I mean, Ming said he's been using Git for a decade and there's still more to learn. So the earlier we can get it to the students, the more likely at some point they might feel like maybe I figured this out. So let's try to like pull that timeline up as much as possible. And you know, imagine being a first year undergraduate who gets to list Git and GitHub as a skill on your resume. That's a pretty good plus. Um, so this is how we set up the course, one organization per course, one repo per student or team per assignment. GitHub generously gives these private so you can, you know, don't worry about what that number comes out to at the end. And they work on team assignments and individual assignments. So let's hit this one first nail. You only get one uh, first day of class. Which would you prefer to do on the first day of class? Install R, install R Studio, install Git, install packages. Chances are you ran out of time, right, at this point. So I like living in this land where we get going and my goal is always to get to the first 
data visualization within the first 10 minutes of the class. That's how I know I'm not going to lose people. Um, 12 was this semester what I achieved, so I'm getting there. Um, so this is the interface that the students are using. The content doesn't really matter, but what I want to show is that everything is in one place, and then we'll talk about why that's important. Um, they use a notebook style editor for their um, analysis and the viewer is embedded in there. The git pane is there so that git status is constantly showing as they edit their work. They can actually, they actually have an embedded diff viewer here so they can see what the diff is as they're working on it. Um, they can commit, they can push, and all of this is happening in the cloud, and hence, the, all that installation stage is completely circumvented. Now, I don't want to downplay the importance of being able to install software. I just feel like day one is not the time to do it. I try to do that more like week 12 out of 15 before they leave the class. Um, another important thing here is that I often am against tools that you know, sandbox students into situations where it works for the introductory class and then nowhere else. This happens to be also a professional tool, so the skills they work on carry them ahead, but the Git interface is limited to the six things you do 98% of the time, but what if you need to do the other two, other 2% two where you really need the other thing? Well, there's a terminal that you can launch and you can get into the whole writing commands as well. So they don't need to leave the environment, and they see this sometimes when we're actually troubleshooting but we try to let them live in this nice land where they can only interface with the six or seven verbs that they really need majority of the time and go here on an as-needed basis. So what does this have to do with collaboration? First, having the same setup really facilitates the students to be able to help each other because if they're looking at a completely different setup in a peer's computer, it's going to be really hard for them to be able to help as they're also learning. And the other thing is I find that students have a really hard time articulating their problems. It's easy to say, it's not working, but I try to avoid my students from using the word it. Don't say it. What is not working? What did you run? So if they have the same setup in front of them and can hear their peers articulate their questions in a certain way, they learn from that language and that helps a lot. They have the rest of their lives to have their picky choices about which text editor to use. And they can do that then, but I feel like intro class is not the place for it. In terms of the workflow, we do the first micromanaging thing. So, um, Again, as an, as an educator, how do you prefer to spend your time? Teaching, grading, managing team conflicts. I like teaching, okay? So I try to stay in that land as much as possible. Um, so what we do is when we're actually introducing the students to the workflow, this is the first lab that they have to complete for the uh, class. I have like really micromanaging um, instructions here. Stop now, commit, use this exact commit message all the way to the bottom of the lab. I mean, I make them insert emojis into their commit messages so they figure out how to do that. The idea is that you kind of get into the habit of writing these commit messages. Obviously, this is very restricting. If you kept this up for 15 weeks, people are going to get tired of it. So we, they just had a midterm about six weeks into the class, and all it says is, we are going to be assessing you on reasonable number of commit frequency and the quality of your commit messages, but we're not hand-holding anymore. And here's an example from one of the students with the name removed while they were working on their take-home exam. A little can commit messages, kind of replicating what I had given them, but you know what? I will take this over a student committing once at the end of their exam any day of the week. So I think that giving them a little bit of hand-holding at the beginning goes a long way. So what does this have to do with collaboration? Well, if they have graded team assignments or assessments and we have given them early pointers for best practices, chances are they don't need to kind of discuss amongst themselves, no, what you're doing isn't enough. No, I want you to do it this way. We've kind of given them the lay of the land of what is good practice. And also being meticulous about regularly committing and pushing your changes, that's what makes you a good collaborator anyway. So we're giving them that skill too. And lastly, Git does not just happen. So um, we actually ha uh, 
you know, do this resolving merge conflicts head on in class. So I'll give you two options for doing this. One is something that has worked well in my smaller class. We have these established teams and also when things go along we have a little bit of a luxury of like stopping and taking a look at what happened. So the setup is that start with ident identical repositories, one for each team, and we also assign numbers to team members, one, two, three, four, and then we actually give them very deliberate instructions. So, the instruction is that only the given member can work, and I literally have students put their hands in their pockets saying do n the others don't get to touch their computer now. So, we do a minor edit, like changing the team name on that file, saving it, committing it, and pushing it to GitHub. Then member number two comes and changes that same line to something other than their team name. They try to commit and push, they get an error. What's the first thing we tell them? Read the error, right? We want to get into the habit of that. It tells you to pull, then go ahead and pull. Locate the merge conflict, and then we talk about what does head mean? Which one do you want? How do we actually edit it? And we actually resolve the merge conflict, remind them that this you also should have a commit message for this, and push ahead. That's one uh, thing that they're going to encounter. And then member three and four actually go through a similar process where the edits are not on the same line anymore. So yes, they still have to pull the document, but they're not going to run into a merge conflict. I find that students find these two things a bit confusing because they actually don't read the error messages and they're like, wait, things are happening. Um, and, so, and the way they will convey it is sometimes it works, sometimes it gives me an error, but actually there are reasons and it's not a random process. Um, in a large class when I tried this it failed spectacularly because I couldn't get a hold of like 80 people at the same time so we tried something else. So here we have one repo for each student and what uh, we do is the students each get that repository and make a very minor edit like change their name on an R Markdown document, save, commit and push. Um, I've been using this um, R package um, for like doing some of the things to interface with the GitHub API called GH class that we've been developing uh, with another faculty member in my department and you know we use it to create repositories and stuff like that but another function we have there is we can actually force push a file and so what I do is after they have done their commit and push I tell them okay don't touch anything now I'm going to force push that same file with my name on it and so the next time you try to interface with it we have to go through that same merge conflict process it's been a lot easier to do the um, big classroom thing that way because it's hard to get them to actually stop touching their computers the other team members um, so what does this have to do with collaboration well Merge conflicts can be hard, right? And so we want to let the first time students struggle with them to be in class in a protected and kind and gentle environment and in an organized fashion, not in a haphazard fashion. They actually know exactly what's coming and we tell them, brace yourselves, an error is on the way. Um, and also myself and the TAs are in the classroom to help. So then the next time it happens, hopefully there's some muscle memory of how they went through it. Um, an observation. People hate merge conflicts so much that they'd rather get together physically and work on things. So, hey, when's the last time you succeeded at getting your students to like meet up physically with each other? So you can use Git to like make them not use Git so they have to get together, okay? Um, so these are the things that have been working in this class. What's next? I have not explored, gone down the path of branching and doing a pull request for your submissions. The reason is, I have zero faith that people are going to actually follow the instructions to a T. But I think there may be ways of automating these things a little bit to help the students. That's something I definitely want to explore because I love the idea of being able to do inline code review. And currently we just do issue filing, which works, but it's just like seeing your comments right there would be so much sweeter. And if we could just figure that out, and figure out how academic um, misconduct and dishonesty works and figure out how to also get them to do peer review, I think I would be in a lot happier person. So hopefully, maybe I'll learn a lot more here, either today in other sessions or maybe coming down the pipeline. Um, so that's the link to my class. All the materials that I produce are um, 
publicly available. There's a GitHub repository, and you can also see the stubs. So the starter repos that the students use for their projects, those are public in the organization. The student repositories are private. So if you're interested in how people are teaching computation in other disciplines, that'd be a cool place to look. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Do you mind if I? So our, uh, our next panelist, you know that he's stoked to talk about Git and GitHub because he came out of sabbatical for this. Um, and, and John's work straddles both industry and the classroom. So he's constantly incorporating standards that he uses with actual real development teams. And when we first spoke, about a year ago maybe, um, yeah, the, he said he likes using GitHub because the feedback was so much richer and more contextual, what Mina is talking about, this inline feedback. Um, and I actually asked him to dig up his old notes on how he used to do feedback several years ago. And he's like, yeah, I think I have them somewhere in a filing cabinet. Um, and there's just a world of difference between when you get an assignment back from your teacher five days later and you're never gonna update it and it's just done versus a teacher finding out exactly where you've gotten stuck and you can help them with it right away. So world of difference. And uh, he's gonna talk a bit about his feedback workflow and how he helps students make progress using this inline code review. Please welcome John David Diocino. All right, so you gotta get this up. I won't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. Thanks again for the invitation. And yeah, I am on sabbatical, but that also kept me from missing class to come here. So that <laughs> kind of works out both ways. Uh, yeah, so um, I wanted to talk to you today, share with you more actually about how I currently do use GitHub uh, in the classroom uh, in conjunction with LMU Computer Science's general approach of trying to bring in industry best practices into the classroom uh, to foster undergraduate education in computer science. So I'm gonna start with LSU, a little history. LMU is not very well known. Uh, it's in between UCLA and UC USC in Los Angeles, but I wanted to let you know how we've been doing computer science there. Uh, then I'll talk about how computer science majors at LMU go through the curriculum overall. And then finally move into the meaty stuff where we talk about how I manage GitHub repositories and how I give feedback. So that's uh, how we'll run things. So really quickly, uh, LMU Computer Science has actually been doing uh, integrating software engineering practices into our curriculum since the early 1980s. Um, my colleague Ray Toll actually likes to joke, in case anyone from Stanford's here, we've actually been doing it for longer than Stanford has been. So that's one of our little things. Um, he has a, a, a website here, I'm not sure if I can click to it from here. A real quick visit, you wouldn't, okay. <laughs> but take note of the URL. Uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. T Ray Toll, has actually cataloged the senior projects that LMU has been producing since 1981-82, all the way to this school year. And what I will point out there when you, visit, when you do visit that site is you'll notice that near the end, in the 2010s, 2012s, all that, the senior projects that are listed almost always have a GitHub repository link attached to them because we also strongly, strongly encourage our seniors to put their senior projects uh, on GitHub as open source. And as uh, Ming actually mentioned, they frequently serve as uh, uh, resumes or portfolios that they eventually present to future in, uh, employers. So in LMU, we have the senior year sequence actually is broken up into a fall project where they work as a team and a spring project where they work solo, because after all, we're granting a bachelor's degree in computer science. We want to make sure that there is also individual mastery. But the team aspect is there. And in fact, in the early aughts, we got some funding from the NSF to explore the integration of the open source culture into the curriculum. And so we actually spent a lot of time looking at what bits and pieces from the open source development culture we could bring in. So that's generally how we've been doing things. And uh, in that continuum, so in the 80s and 90s, there wasn't much going on in terms of version control, but around 2000s, version control started as an advanced thing. The seniors got to do it when they went into their senior project. What we've noticed as, is as the years have gone by, version control 
started earlier and earlier to the point where we're in now where version control is introduced for, at the very first semester uh, as a computer science major at LMU. And additional tools like continuous integration, participation in open source projects have also sort of moved a little earlier down the scale. And so to this point, we are now at a point where LMU computer science majors experience GitHub from the very beginning. And uh, I also happen to like the XKCD web cartoons every now and then I'll insert. So this right here is a little cartoon just talking about uh, what will happen if you don't really get it together with version control. You start seeing all these files on your hard drive, version one, version two, final version, final, final version, not quite final version. So the good, th good, good news is we try to get our students to not even get started <laughs> with that possibility. So in LMU today, we start LMU students with GitHub uh, from the very beginning, we use GitHub Classroom to immediately give them private repositories and distribute assignments through these repositories. A uh, little quick diagram schematic down there is Classroom and the, uh, GitHub private organizations. Uh, as mentioned, GitHub Education will give you an educational discount on that so you wouldn't have to worry about paying for them. They provide students with repositories and on the side, uh, we have a continuous integration system called Jenkins to watch over their repositories to give feedback on linting, formatting, and style. So I don't know how many times you've had to say things like indent here, not enough indent, add more space, bad variable name. The good news is there are tools from industry that, that can help you save time in that. Jenkins is one of them, uh, and we connect that to our repository. So this is a screenshot of how we introduce students to version control. Uh, one of the things we do is we try not to scare them off with the git command right away. We actually simply tell them to use GitHub as a website. So we don't even get, you know, get too fancy with terminology. We simply tell them, hey, whenever you submit your work, here's a URL that's been assigned to you. And whenever you submit your work, just copy paste. And so they copy and paste into GitHub's editor uh, they may not even, they, they, they don't necessarily even know that they're doing commits, but there's a nice little foreshadowing hint is when GitHub has you edit a file on their website, you're supposed to submit a commit message anyway. So down there at the bottom, they submit a commit message. I simply tell them, just give me an idea what you did here, right? You're copying and pasting your code. What did you do at this point? So that's how we introduce it to them so that they don't get, you know, overly intimidated right away. Um, but that gets them into the habit. The other thing that we also do is because of our integration with this Jenkins system, whenever they commit, you'll notice they will get in their commit history a little red X or a green check, which is in an indication of whether Jenkins approved or succeeded in their submission. And you'll notice on the right that when they click on the red X, they'll actually get a report from Jenkins that tells them, I'm not sure if the text is clear enough there, but it'll actually tell them insufficient indents, you know, incorrect capitalization convention, please use this instead of that. And they get feedback with no time spent on my part <laughs> uh, on how to style and format their code right away. And in a sense, I just kind of offer it up as a matter of fact that this is simply the environment that you're in. And the good news is when they go out into industry, they're gonna encounter an environment that pretty much matches the way this work flows. So uh, freshmen do that, and just as a little aside, uh, if you can read the comments, there's a GitHub cartoon about, uh, sorry, an XKCD cartoon about how our commit comments get a little looser the longer you're working on things and it's kind of fun to see in actual commit histories that that's actually happening so um i guess if these slides are released you can just kind of uh, enjoy those real commit messages by real freshmen um all right so when freshmen dive in uh, they simply start that way they they know no other way of working as the years go on by sophomore year they do start getting curious about this command line thing that the professors are using. So they just naturally start looking at git commands. Uh, we, we help them, of course, and we have a, a computer science lab with a full-time lab manager who can also provide assistance along with TAs. Third year students start getting a full-blown workflow because in third year, that's when they start doing projects, graphics projects, compilers, 
uh, operating system kernels. And there, Git really just comes in. It simply just emerges as the way to work. And that's when they get more advanced concepts, uh, their exposure to branching, pull requests, uh, extended continuous integration, such that now by senior year, when they start on their projects, they just naturally gravitate to starting a repo. Uh, when I started teaching in the early 2000s, it took two or three weeks for them to get a version control repository up and running. Uh, now they just started on day one because they already know how to do it. And the good news there is they start diving into their projects right away. They, and they, spend up, they end up spending more time developing their projects than trying to work with the tools to actually manage the development. So that's computer science at LMU, at least how students explore the software engineering aspect of it. Now, how do we get that to happen? So there's a little cartoon over here which essentially talks about what you've heard before. Uh, no one ever eventually masters Git, and there's always this, uh, this fallback where you can always reclone your repo from the beginning. And that's just, uh, you know, I've done that a few times. I'm sure we've all done that a few times. But we still try to manage them the way Linus intended Git to, to work. Um, and so here's my particular situation, and this might be uh, shared by many of you. You know, over the years, I've accumulated a pool of exercises and projects and assignments. Uh, I keep them myself in my own private GitHub repository. So I have those, but to integrate with GitHub Classroom, which is more of a per assignment, per course, per offering model, I've had to work on a little bit of workflow, right? Students don't need to see your private, in fact, they shouldn't see your private repository, your decades of assignments and revisions and corrections. Students also only need to see one assignment at a time. And here, in this slight break from the Git model, they don't actually need to commit back. They don't, well, if I, if I do see something I'd like to keep from my students, I'll just commit it myself. But they don't need to dynamically uh, issue pull requests. So the workflow I've done here, and I'll just do it really quickly since this might be a, a little too much, is I do have my master courseware repository, which I've been maintaining over the years. Whenever I interact with GitHub Classroom, I use one of those super advanced, I just had to learn it for this, Git features called Git Subtree, where I can actually dole out just a subdirectory of my repository for the use of GitHub Classroom. And when I get it to GitHub Classroom, I erase the history thanks to Git reset push force. I'll just throw that out there. You don't have to know what that is. I'll just uh, try to give credibility to my <laughs> Git foo. Um, <laughs> And then I provide instructions in the README. So once students actually get the repository, it looks clean. There's no baggage. You know, It's a repository for them from which they can start working and doing their assignment. So once they have that repository, they start using it. And so do I. So when we start giving feedback, uh, let me give a brief uh, background on my own feedback philosophy. Uh, I like the work of L.D. Fink. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar. Okay, I see some nods. So he uh, did, a, did something called, cre uh, did a lot of work on creating significant learning experiences in the early 2000s. He has a book uh, from 2003. And one of the aspects of that uh, significant learning uh, framework that he built is a concept that he called fidelity feedback. Fidelity being a sort of acronym for frequent, immediate, discriminating, as in based on clear criteria and standards, not the other kind of discriminating, that would suck, uh, and delivered lovingly. Yes, that is in a scholarly work of education. <laughs> Loving feedback, okay? So that's fidelity feedback, and I would dare say uh, GitHub is excellent at delivering the frequent and the immediate. I think the discriminating is up to the professor, and lovingly as well, if you frame your feedback in the right way. So. This is what Vanessa was referring to uh, as the old way of giving feedback. And again, you know, some of you might, I see some nods, some of you might be familiar. You print something out, you mark it up with a pen, red or otherwise. And then the back page usually is a, is a summary handwritten of, you know, whatever my rubric is for grading and my own notes. And yeah, that took a lot of time uh, and wasn't the, great, the greatest mechanism for actually de delivering feedback. Uh, because it's delivered at the end, it's what Fink calls auditive feedback rather than educative feedback, because you kind of give it to them at the end. So what they do is that 
they've seen what they do wrong, but only at the end of the assignment. What can they do while they're working on the project? So this is how I'm able to do feedback now. Uh, Git commits uh, are allowed to have attach, allow us to attach uh, comments on every line that has changed. And so what you see here is a typical screen where on the left side is a previous submission, on the right side is a new submission, and I simply just say, well, here's, here's something that's going on in this very line. And uh, I provide some feedback to that end. A couple of other screenshots, you can also talk about something they deleted. So in this case, a student actually did something from a line that they deleted, and you can attach the comment to the left side in case it's just more relevant that, hey, by the way, you actually didn't have to change this, or you could have done this better. Uh, of course, the good news is that the feedback is also is two-way. So it's not just me posting comments, but they can also reply back. And you know they can be very candid. So in this particular case, I just tell the student, just stare really hard at this to figure out what's going wrong. And they just go, you know, um, yeah, oh my god, thank you. So, and uh, as Mine said, it, you can use emoji in GitHub comments. I, it's funny how that's becoming a thing. So yeah, emoji to kind of acknowledge to get time to kind of acknowledge, yes, I'm glad you saw it for yourself. And so it's nice, even if it's just a thank you from a student, it's just nice to see that they saw it, they read it, and they said thank you, and enough said. So these are screenshots of the GitHub uh, commit comment pages and displays, where you can basically click, type things right in, and submit. And uh, if the student set it up properly, the comment actually gets sent to them as email they can reply both by email or by going to the website. Another element of flexibility, because you know, in case they're off with just their smartphone, they can just see the comment, hit reply, and that comment actually gets delivered to the comment thread as well, so it's nice and flexible. Uh, so there are a few things to work out. Uh, GitHub comments are connected to commits and uh, a feature we call pull requests. So it's not just, here's a file and here's a comment. So it's not like the kind of comment that you can do, say, on Microsoft Word or in Google Docs. Uh, they have to be attached to a commit, and that does have a few logistical challenges, because you have to make sure that students then commit, if they, if they commit the way they should, which is in a really granular way, it potentially scatters all your comments across multiple commits. So the feature of a pull request is really helpful, because the pull request gathers a bunch of changes together and allows them to be turned into you as a submission, but pull requests can be considered a little advanced and potentially be intimidating. So it kind of goes both ways. The, uh, the compromise I've reached is that, well, you know, when students are just starting out, they're probably not going to commit that granularly anyway. Uh, they'll have large commits. They'll commit on the day they submit. So it kind of works out that before I introduce branches or pull requests to them, I, it is feasible to comment directly on their commits because their commits are also fairly large. As they advance, they learn to commit in more granular pieces the way they should, but at the same time, they become more capable of handling more advanced concepts like branches and pull requests. So the shift to using pull requests has turned out to be fairly natural. Uh, but that is something I had to sort of work out early, that, oh, I can only comment on committed code. And so I had to make sure that I told students where to find them and they knew where to find uh, those, those comments on the page. But that does eventually work out. And uh, at this point, by junior year, they can merge, they can branch, they can do pull requests. And then I can commit in a code review format, which puts all the feedback together. And in the end, that is the ideal situation. GitHub also helps with QA and troubleshooting. Not QA, sorry, that's quality assessment. Uh, quality assurance, Q and A, question and answer and troubleshooting. And in, in, in this, the, the point here is you, the professor, are as capable of committing into the repositories as the students are. So another thing I frequently do is, and you know, some students are not as comfortable interacting on the page, they might send me emails. I use uh, GitHub as a great feature that when you're looking at a piece of source code, if you click on the lines on the left, the line numbers, it'll actually produce line-specific links, such that if you click on that link, not only do you get taken to the source code, you get taken to the line, 
on that code. So I frequently do that, not too visible here, but the little blue links on the lower left email are just me giving the student these line-specific comments on what might have gone wrong. And if I sense that, hmm, this student is really doing a lot of email and maybe I should let them use GitHub, what I also do is I put a comment in GitHub and I give them the link to the comment in the email. I just say, oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I found out what's wrong with your code. I put a comment in GitHub, here it is. So the, the middle email with the one line, that's me offering a comment. And of course, when they click through, uh, there are also comment-specific links possible in GitHub, so that the moment they click on the comment, they go right to the comment. They don't have to dig around or scroll around. And that helps very much in troubleshooting, helping students with their problems. Uh, another thing I do here is I can also commit to the students' repositories as well. And uh, when I teach my various courses, so I teach courses in both beginning programming and upper division, I teach interaction design, computer graphics, a slew of courses, um, I frequently allocate certain class sessions as troubleshooting shooting sessions, where I simply tell students, hey, tell me what's wrong, and I'll fix it for you. So we catalog, there's usually enough time in one session to address five or six different student problems, those who are willing to talk about what they're having. I clone their repository on the spot, on the screen. I'm also doing a screen capture so that students can review what went on uh, after the session. I clone on the screen, I open the code, I talk through the code, and if I find the fix, most of the time I've managed to, uh, I will commit a fix right there. And uh, I'll go ahead and commit the fix, I'll actually show them uh, the terminal window with me using the git command line to do an add commit and push, and that also in my mind helps reinforce to them that hey, this is just how we do things. Um, and then, of course, they can also see the commit in their history. So I, I found that students tended to like that, hey, professor fixed something for me. Cool, I got that for free. And the recording of, of the class session allows students to go back and sort of listen to my kind of rubber duck debugging kind of session. So I know why I'm rubber ducking in front of students. Uh, in case you're not familiar with the term, rubber duck debugging is the term they attach to. What if you were talking through your code to a rubber duck on your desk. And that frequently allows you to actually figure out what's wrong with your code just by talking through it. So in a sense, I use the class as a rubber duck and we find, you know, we find the problem. But again, the use of GitHub allows me to actually go into the repository directly and submit it for them. And it also gives them a taste of future collaborative development when they are working with multiple colleagues on, on a piece of code. Uh, of course, again, we'll bring up the issue of academic, uh, academic integrity. So this practice will generally only work for assignments of sufficient size. That way you're not actually doing their entire homework in front of them, right? So <laughs> the, it works well for projects, two week, three week long assignments with a good chunk of code where you're just fixing little bits and that's helpful. Uh, the other thing that uh, I recommend is that these should be f for assignments that have high individual variation. A graphics project, a compiler project, uh, a personal operating system kernel project. You know, that way a student doesn't look at some, someone else's code and goes, hey, cool, I'm just going to grab that and put it in my own project. Uh, by, by doing this with assignments that have individual variation anyway, you kind of avoid the potential specter of academic integrity because their own project should have something that's specific to the student as well. So as long as you kind of tailor your assignment in a way that occasionally seeing five to ten line fragments of code from another student doesn't compromise the assignment, then that works out okay. So I am sensitive to that. I won't do like a first year programming assignment where go write this for loop and do that in class, you know. Uh, I will sometimes do that and make them think that they get something for free, but of course I planned the whole thing the whole time, right? So uh, in that context, committing to the repository also works well for me. So um, that's a general overview of how I've been using GitHub in classes, and it works very well with LMU's general tradition of uh, integrating software en engineering best practices in the curriculum from the beginning. Uh, in our latest incarnation, students are exposed to this from freshman year, 
and it works out nicely. By the time they get to senior year, they have these nice portfolios of GitHub repositories for their senior projects, which they frequently show off to potential employers and grad schools, I will have to say also. Um, our current approach uses GitHub and Jenkins. Uh, we, GitHub is very good at LD Think's fidelity feedback cycle. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, in that particular body of work, it's a nice fit. And so, and, as, and finally, I'm also able to answer questions and commit to the repository, allowing students to get a feel for what collaborative uh, work may be. And I guess one last thing, merge conflicts sometimes do happen because I will commit work to a student's repository. When they get to work, they forget to pull. They'll modify their code, try to push, get a conflict, and so it's also a nice natural way to say, oh, remember, yeah, remember, I touched your homework in class today. And so they get to do that. Uh, that's pretty much my story, and here are a few references. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Oh, oh, on the power we got two mics. All right, so if you have questions for our panelists, please find them down at the booth. I'm going to ask them to hang out at the booth until the next session, so you can ask them one-on-one. -on -one. Tomorrow at 3.45, if you're interested in the student perspective on all this, we have four campus experts who have completed uh, training from GitHub Education, and they are, it's an international crew. We have someone here from the UK, we have Chris Cannon here from North Carolina A&T, um, and so that I'm really excited for their, them to share their experiences outside the classroom with motivation and engagement. Um, if you have questions about GitHub, look for the logo. There are 13 of us here. Um, we will get you your questions answered. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you tomorrow or down at the booth. Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you.